It's been a real joy to be with you and to share in the things of God and how I thank you for your hungry hearts. You know, it's, it's hunger for truth that prepares the atmosphere for truth. You can't feed people that have no appetite. And it's hard, isn't it? You know when people come in your home and you've prepared, you've prepared seven course dinner for them and they'll say, well, we weren't expecting this and we're really not hungry. So night after night you have come and sat here and the week has just flown and I declare it has been I have preached hard, but it has been easy to speak to you. And in my body, I don't feel that I've been through a week of meetings. I don't feel any different than I felt last Sunday morning. My, th my voice might sound a little bit like I've been through something, but I, I, that doesn't, I don't feel badly at all. So if you can not listen to the voice, but listen to the, the truth this morning. I want to speak to you on a subject that heaven adores. And when I approach it, I can, I can just feel all heaven is just above that roof. We can't see them, but all heaven, I feel, is just hanging above that roof. A subject that all heaven loves and all hell hates. And all the real children of God love it. For years, I have had a burden for real worship in spirit and in truth to come back into the church. I've talked about it. I've, I've preached about it everywhere. Some have said it in, sounds interesting, sounds like it would be wonderful, and have gone back to their programs and felt they could do a better job and uh, wanted to plan their own meetings and have it their own way. And others have said, pray that we will have this grace in our meetings. And other places they just unfold like a little flower. We have to have that mantle of the Holy Spirit to help us. We just have to have God. We have to have him. All right, I'll read a text. The fourth chapter of St. John's Gospel, the 21st and, or the 22nd, 23rd, 24th verses. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him, you finish it with me, will you? Yes. The lack, the lack of worship in our churches. All over the world, has has been such a burden to my heart. I, I'm so happy for what the precious Holy Spirit is doing in this refreshing that he's sending on the church 
and this outpouring of the Holy Spirit now, the worship that is returning to the church. 10,000 thanks to Jesus. And uh, I have preached it, prayed for it, contended for it, talked about it. It seemed that so many of the song leaders and churches was completely out of tune with what God wanted to do and completely out of touch with worship in the scriptures and with, with worship that's given to us all through the word of God. So I, I took it to the Lord in prayer. Being, being an evangelist and a convention speaker and in, a, in all of our Bible schools and conferences and everywhere, and I'd go into the meetings and, and leave almost sick sometimes. I couldn't enthuse with what was happening. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't be a hypocrite. I couldn't say amen. I couldn't enter into things. I couldn't sing some of the songs that other people seem to be blessed in and blessed with. I just couldn't enter into it and I couldn't enthuse with it. And isn't that wonderful? Well, I'd swallow and say, well, it's, it, it, it's interesting. That's all I could say. It's interesting. And I prayed and I fasted and prayed. And I guess it's the burden, you know, catches up to you after a while. And the things that our spirit and soul and body are so integrated and so related that we react. Whatever affects the spirit affects the body. And after a while I, I reacted physically. So I gave up my meetings and went home. And I said, Jesus, I, I, I won't be a hypocrite. I can't be a hypocrite. I don't know what to do. And this was after when I went home ill. I gave up and went home because I was ill. It was after a camp meeting. And at this camp meeting, uh, Jazz, it was jazz then that was beginning to come into the church. And in that camp meeting, they, they, they knew how to jazz all hail the power of Jesus' name until you didn't, you hardly knew what was being sung. I actually heard, heard them try their dead level best to get the beat into holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. I remember one of the ministers sitting on the platform beside me when I burst into tears and he said, Sister Helen, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, we're having a marvelous camp meeting. What's the matter? And of course I couldn't tell him. I went home and I worsened and worsened and worsened because this burden was on me and I was praying, Jesus, what will I, I don't know what to do, help me. And I guess under the burden of it, my kidney, kidney convulsed. And it was on a Sunday morning when my body began to twist and I couldn't stop it. And it just kept going and going, going until my head was down at my heels. Then I was, 
I couldn't do anything about it. I, some kind of noise that I made brought my father out of one room and my mother out of her bedroom. They sent for the doctor. The doctor didn't know. He looked at me. My flesh had turned gray. When he came into the room, he, doctor's language, he swore. He said, this is the worst pain that can touch the human body. I know what this is. And he started putting morphine into me. A day came, I, I won't tell you how long this lasted. That's not important. I'm coming to the important part. The day came when Jesus said to me, you may have communion today. I didn't know whether he was going to take me home that day. And that would have been wonderful. I didn't know, but here was this thought of the, the elements in the communion. Did he mean this? And I was lying there. My family had been notified. My poor little mother, the, the vigilance of that precious little woman at my bed. She's with Jesus this morning. But uh, while I was lying there, Brother Kermit Jeffrey's father was my pastor. <sighs> a man of God, I tell you. A man that knew God and a man who knew how to touch God, a man who was lit of God. He wasn't sent for, he had been there many times. But this day he felt led of God to come to my house and to hurry. So he came and shortly after he came, two other of the most spiritual women in the church came. And, and I knew, I knew then that the Lord wanted me to have the elements, the bread and the wine. But he told me to ask Brother Jeffrey the meaning of this. What, what does this bread and wine, what does this mean? And I, Brother Jeffrey, his father doesn't know this, but... Jesus had just given me such a marvelous revelation of the meaning of the bread and the wine. I didn't want that revelation disturbed. And I wasn't sure Brother Jeffries had heard what I had heard. And I didn't want to ask him. But I knew I'd better be obedient. So my little mother brought us some grape juice and 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 bread and I turned to him I said brother Jeffrey what is what is the meaning of this there was such a presence of God there he didn't answer me then we took the bread we took the bread, and again I said to him, Brother Jeffries, you must tell me, what is the meaning of this broken bread and poured out wine? What does it mean? And when I obeyed and did what the Lord asked me to do, my poor head, I was trying to sit up a little bit, my poor head went back on that pillow and I left them. I left them. 
And I was in heaven with Jesus for two and one half hours. I knew, I knew then what it was all about and why I had come there. Jesus met me. And I, if I can just parenthetically here say, honey, never fear death. As a child of God, there's no dark valley to pass through. There's no Jordan to wade through. There's no muddy waters. There's no awful blackness. None of that stuff. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the very moment my eyes were closed here, they were wide open there, and I was with Jesus immediately. There just seemed to be no time elapse whatsoever. I was immediately with Jesus. And in that two and a half hours, some marvelous, marvelous things happened. And I won't, I won't go into all of that. But what he wants me to tell you about this morning, there was a, a mist, just like a mist that shut me in with him. And he and I were all alone for a while. And the mist strolled back little by little. And the saints, some of the saints of God that I knew, that I knew here were there. I saw them. I talked with them. I asked them questions. They gave me answers. And then Jesus just lifted his hand and rolled back that entire curtain. And there were all those 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousand angelic worshipers worshiping Jesus, worshiping him, worshiping him. He knew the burden of my heart and the burden of my heart for worship in the church of Jesus Christ was of such a nature that he took me to heaven to let me hear real worship in spirit and in truth, to let me know what real worship is. Oh, the atmosphere that he lives in, my dear. The atmosphere that Jesus lives in where all these 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands that, that in heaven there are 10,000 choirs. Each choir has 10,000 voices. This is the 10,000 times 10,000 10, choirs. Far as I could see, far as I could see were these angelic creatures. Far as I could see, there was just just no end. They filled all space beyond the horizons that I could see. They were just everywhere, everywhere. They didn't pay any attention to me. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't even know I was there. There was only one that they were concerned about. Only one they were interested in. Only one that they wanted to worship and adore. His name is Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus. They were only interested in him. And he let me hear those angels worshiping him. Ooh, I wish you could, I wish you could hear the worship of heaven. That's the atmosphere that he left when he came. That's the atmosphere that he left when he came. As many angels as could, as many as could, as many as could trailed him as far as they could trail him and came just as close to earth as they could come. A few shepherds on the hillside heard them. But as many as could steal out of heaven and come came and filled those hillsides still worshiping and still adoring and trying to tell us who was coming, trying to tell us of this royal visitor and who was coming and still wanting us to give glory to God in the highest. Oh, don't let him down. But these angels, the, the, the worship, can you imagine 10,000 choirs all singing the same thing? 10,000 times 10,000 without one single discord in the most marvelous har harmony that we don't know anything about. I couldn't, when Jesus let me come back here, it was, it was the longest time I couldn't stand music. I just couldn't stand music of any kind. My very first meeting was in one of the largest churches in the Assemblies of God. And when they started the song service, I got up and stopped it. Please don't. Don't do that. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. Don't do Please don't do that. Don't do that. Let me tell you. Let me talk to you. And, and, and I told them where I, where I had been and where I'd come from to them and what, what I had heard. These angels, these angels, what they are singing is, it's in the singing book that the Holy Spirit has given us. The singing book for the church is the, is the book of Revelation. And all the songs of the redeemed and the songs of the saints and the songs of the angels. There are eight marvelous oratorios in the book of Revelation that is being sung constantly in his holy presence. Holy is he that is, holy is he that was, holy is he that evermore shall be, holy is the Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Spirit. All of them saying the same thing at the same time, giving him honor and giving him glory. And then they burst. They just, they just, ooh, I, if I could, the Holy Spirit will just have to make it real to you. Because when they get singing about his, his honor, his honor and his glory, and his power, and his might, and his wisdom, and his strength in this oratorio that's in the Revelation. Oh, when they, when they begin to sing about this, everything that is in them just seemed to burst, to burst. The worship didn't just come out of their mouths. It, it didn't just come through their lips. It came out their eyes. It came, it came, I saw the worship, I saw the color, the color of the worship, the texture of the worship as it poured out their very, the pores of angelic beings. It poured through their hands, it poured through their feet, it came out their bodies, it came through every part of their being. 
If angels have spirits and souls and body, every part of them were caught up and pouring out this adoration to the Lamb that is worthy. Oh, how they would sing. How they would sing about his worthiness and his riches and his wisdom and his strength and his honor and his glory. And I ask, why, why, why? Is there this extra strength in pouring out when they touch on certain words? And in the spirit immediately I understood that these were the things that Jesus was stripped of and that he gave up and left behind with the Father when he came down here to redeem us and left all that there. And they are so concerned about him and so concerned for him. They want all that restored to him. And so when they touch on those notes of glory, honor, wisdom, and power, and dominion, and might belongs to him. And let all that be given back to him. Oh, how they love him. Oh, how they love him. How they love him. I want to show you something. Maybe you, maybe you hadn't thought of it, and maybe you have thought of it. Do you know that terrific battle that took place right in the heavenlies, right in the presence of the throne of God, and all these angels were involved? And every angel in heaven was tested. And L Lucifer, the devil, was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to deflect the worship from Jesus. And he wanted it for himself. And he influenced one third, one third of all the angelic hosts in heaven. He influenced them to turn the worship away from Jesus to him. And all these other angels had been tried to. Every angel in heaven has been tested and has been tried. And they went through that battle in heaven. They went through that. They went through that. And that's why they so love Jesus and stand with him and stood by him all the time that he was down here through all of those satanic attacks against him of the devil. These angels had been tested and tempted and they had gone through victoriously so they could come and help Jesus through his testing and his trying time. And every time Jesus was tested and tempted down here, angels who had already taken their stand against Lucifer rushed to the help of Jesus to help him through. And when I looked out upon these angelic worshipers and I saw them, there was some right in the front lines of the choirs. <laughs> and Jesus let me recognize them. He let me know who they were. Some of them I knew were those who had sung at his birth. I just knew who they were. I knew they were the, the ones sang at his birth. There were those who were, were with him in his temptation out there in the wilderness. They had been, there was a little group right up here. I can see them now. I see them now. They stood by him and watched him being tempted by the devil out there in the wilderness. And just as soon as that temptation was over, that's the crowd that flew to him to strengthen him out there in the wilderness in that temptation. Oh, how they loved him. How they worshipped him, how they adored him, and they could, they could help him, they could help him, they, they had already had their testing time, I think that's beautiful, they had had their testing time, and could come to him, been 
through that awful battle in the heavens. They sang at his birth. They worshipped him at that time. And, and through every other testing time that he had, they were there. They were there to strengthen and to help him. Oh, 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 the harmony. If you could just understand that, hear that harmony, and, and know what this worship, if you, if you could ever hear the worship in heaven, and then listen to some of the things that we offer him as worship. You'd under, you know what I'm talking about, and you'd understand something of how I feel, how I feel about it. To really worship Jesus, you have to love him. You have to love him. To really and truly worship Jesus, you have to love him. And to really love him the way he wants to be loved, we have to know him. We, we have to know him because Isaiah says if you don't know him, there will be no beauty in him that you will desire him. Now that's not physical beauty. There is no beauty in him. There isn't one single thing about him that appeals to the natural man. Those who are in his company, you want to know who's in his company? Just read the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who wants to be, who wants to be poor in spirit? Blessed are the meek. Ah, that's for the birds. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. That's... We're not interested in that. This is the 20th century. This is 1977. Just move out of my road and, and uh, just let me go my way. There's nothing about Jesus that appeals or tracks any way to the human and to the flesh. And the flesh and the human is forever wanting to get out of bounds and have its fling and do things its way and rejecting discipline. This is what I want. This is the way I'm going to do it. Get off my back. It doesn't matter even if it affects Jesus on the throne. This is who I am. This is what I want. And I'm going to do it my way. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, I've had them tell me that. You, I, That's your way you see it. I don't see it that way. Oh, I want to tell you something. That little group in the Word of God called the elect, the firstborn, the overcomers, the bride of Christ, I want to tell you, she will lead the worship in throughout the new universe forever and ever and ever and ever. The bride, the bride, that, that, that little nucleus, the bride, not the whole church, the bride. There's a difference. She will, the four beasts, when they cry, Amen. Then the next level, the four and twenty elders say, Amen. The multitude that no man can number say, Amen. But in every oratorio, the bride is leading the worship of heaven. The bride of Jesus Christ is a company of people in whom and to whom Jesus Christ is everything, 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 everything. Fully redeemed. She is fully redeemed. She is fully redeemed. She is fully redeemed. Redemption. This is his name. He's the redeemer. 
He's going to have a bride. He's going to have a bride to show forth the glory, the praise, the honor of his perfect redemption. She has to be redeemed, fully redeemed, fully redeemed in spirit. So she is a completely disciplined spirit. She's fully redeemed in soul. All mental attitudes, no rebellion, no resistance, no resentment, no place for this. She is redeemed, spirit and soul and body. And throughout the countless ages, through her, he's going to show forth his glory in the new heaven and in the new earth and a whole new universe that he will bring into existence. My dear, if you knew what God has prepared out there ahead for, for you, oh, honey, if you only knew what's prepared for us. And then I feel so sorry in the light of all that this book tells us Somebody will come up and say, Sister Hammond, do I really have to give up cocktails? And I said, I just, I just yesterday says, no, no, you do not have to give up your cocktails if you do not think Jesus Christ is worth it. Who could, who could sin against such a lamb, such a redeemer? I'll talk more about this tonight. Why do I feel this message so important? I have been invited back to Japan. And the superintendent out there wrote me, says, oh, Sister Hammond, if you could, if you can only come and teach us how or show us how or help us in this manner of worship. We, we feel the Lord wants to bring us into worship. Come and help us. Brother Lehman came to see me on Thursday, and I told him I was going out to his Ghana. I know he was here in the missionary conference. And I said, Brother Lehman, what do you want me to tell your people in Africa? And with tears streaming down his face, he says, Oh, Sister Hammond, if you can just help my people to worship Jesus. If you can just go and help them to worship Jesus. Yes, I said, that's the message. That's the message that's on my heart. This was the last prayer of Jesus. He said to that, when he began his ministry and met that little woman at the well, and he opened his heart. This was the beginning of the opening of his heart to human aid. And he said to her, I thirst. I thirst. He wasn't thirsting for the water that was in that well where they were. And we don't read that he drank any of the water from that well. Neither did she. It says she left her pitcher and went away. He thirst for our fellowship. He thirsts for communion with us. He thirsts for our love. He wants to be first in our life and in our love. Is that asking too much? When he gave his all, is that asking too much that he be first in our life? 
All right, that was the beginning of his ministry. When he was hanging on the cross, when he was hanging on the cross, we hear him, his last cry, his last prayer. I rarely ever did Jesus use that word. Rarely ever. But most of the time when he did it has to do with the sub with our love and adoration and devotion to him i thirst what was he there thirsting give me to drink he said to this woman give me to drink on the cross he says i thirst for what for what for uh, now he was paying the price to have the bride and he says if the scriptures say, for the joy that was set before him, he endured, he went to the cross, endured the shame of that old cross for the, for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? What was that joy? That now this precious Holy Spirit that took him through would be poured out upon his bride and would help her to really know who he was and yield herself to him to give his heart ache and hunger and longing the satisfaction, the worship, the adoration that he wants from a bride, his co-equal, his co-equal. That's who she will be. That's who she will be. Worshipping and adoring him. This is the main subject, really, all through the scriptures. We talk about the bloodline through the scriptures. Well, honey, under, underlining the bloodline is this line which is uh, the worship, the worship line, the worship that he desires. Worship in the Bible is always associated with an altar. Always. There are always. The self has to be on the altar for the worship to come forth that he wants. Um, Genesis is a book of departing from God when man failed God. There's no real worship in the book of Genesis. But we come over in the book of Exodus. Exodus is a book of redemption. And here the lamb is on the altar. And, and Israel is about to be released and redeemed. And the song of redemption really begins. The whole first part of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the, there's, there's woe unto you, woe unto you, and there's nothing but bondage and bondage and bondage until we come to the, to the 53rd chapter. In the 53rd chapter, the Lamb is sacrificed for us, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace is upon him. With his stripes we are healed. And the 54th chapter immediately begins with Sing, O barren. Sing, O barren. And the song of redemption begins immediately in that 54th chapter of Isaiah. Read through the Gospels. The night Jesus was betrayed, they sang a song and went out. And the song of the Lord begins. The song of the saints begins. And wherever that real song of redemption and the song of the saint, where Jesus is truly worshipped and adored, things really happen. I have seen more people saved in an atmosphere of worship than any other atmosphere. I have seen more people baptized in the Spirit in an atmosphere of worship than any other atmosphere. When we worship, I could give any other message. Just before I left the room, just before I looked up to Jesus, I said, oh, Jesus, is, is there something? Something more is, is it right? 
Is it right that I give this message this morning? And immediately the dear spirit answered back, when I'm worshipped, you have everything. You have everything. It releases the presence of God. The pres releases the power of God. He inhabiteth the praises of his people. The praises of his people. Yes. I went through one meeting. I don't think the song leader ever stood up to the desk to lead a song. The Holy Ghost was in control. The most magnificent worship you could ever hear. I'd walk down the aisle. Do you want to come to Jesus? Yes. Do you want to come to Yes. Will you come to Jesus? Yes. I was hoping there'd be an opportunity. Oh, yes. And they came from everywhere, baptized in the Holy Spirit in the classrooms. The church couldn't begin to hold the people, and we had to bolt the door. The fire department made us bolt the door and not let any more people in. They were everywhere. They were listening in other rooms, in the Sunday school rooms, upstairs, downstairs. They were receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we knew every time somebody else received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, instead of some lightness about it, they started singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And we said, listen, somebody's getting a baptism up there. And then we'd hear, they're getting it over there, listen. And this was just blending back and forth. That revival has gone on and on. Oh, when he's worshipped, when he's adored, when he's adored. I don't know whether to tell you what he told me about you here or not. But maybe it'll help you if I tell you. I say, oh, Jesus, it's so beautiful what you're doing in Trinity. It's so beautiful what you're doing. Can, can the revival, can it break? Can it break while I'm here? Will you let it break now while I'm here? Is this the time, Jesus? And he said, no, I can't send it yet. There isn't enough holiness to carry, to undergird what I want to send. There isn't enough holiness. I can't send it yet. I hope that will help. I hope that will help. I hope that will help. God hates mixture. He hates mixture. We don't owe the world anything. We don't owe the flesh, the devil, anything. We don't owe Hollywood anything. We don't have to borrow anything from them. I beg of you, I plead with you, for God's sake, leave Hollywood in Hollywood. For God's sake, leave that hellish, heathenish, ungodly beat out of this place. Out, for God's sake, out! And let holiness and a pure purity in the worship of Jesus Christ come through. And I hope you all say, Amen. 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 In the, in the, I'll, I'll tell you, just share with you just one thing before closing. I was in Wilkes-Barre in Pennsylvania, which is a Welsh. I have been to Wales, and I know how they love harmony. And there's a Welch settlement over in Pennsylvania. And I was in Wilkes-Barre in this Welch settlement. And on this Sunday morning, God came. God, and he asked me, he asked me to ask them to sing holy, holy, holy. And so we did. We did. And while we were singing it, they carried into the church a woman on a chair with the tissue. The tissues were burned out of her throat and nostrils with hot Clorox fumes. And, and it looked like the woman was dying. 
<laughs> and I was in the platform and they carried her down and asked me to pray for her. And it was just like the dear spirit did this, that I was not to pray for that woman now. And that's hard. That's hard. It looks like somebody's dying and you say, well, I won't pray for her now. Just, just wait in the Lord's will and time I'll pray for her. That's almost cruel, but not in God. Because nothing happens anyhow unless we move in God. So I said, just, just put that chair down there, leave her there, and let's sing holy, holy, holy. And we sang it in the first verse and the second verse. I've, I've never done this again any time, anywhere. But the Lord says, ask them to sing it in the tongue that I've given them. And I, that whole congregation began to sing holy, holy, holy in the tongue that he had given them. And I felt a power come into that. And the Holy Ghost got into it. And they started singing, worshiping, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And my dear, that God, the Holy Ghost, brought that congregation into such oneness, into such purity of worship into perfection of worship. Oh, that whole meeting had been about the Lamb. That whole meeting had been for his sake, for his glory. And, and now in this Sunday morning service, he brought us into such beautiful harmony and perfect worship that when we were through singing it the last time that they sang it in other tongues, about 12 people in that congregation stood to their feet, and the one did not know the other one was on their feet, and they all began to sing the same song in the same tongue at the same time in the most in harmony, you cannot hear that harmony in any metropolitan opera house in the world. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot. And the, how they sang. And when, when that, we, then they went into antiphonal singing. And someone in the back started singing of his worthiness. And somebody up in front answered and somebody in the back sang and somebody in the front answered. And I said, oh, Lord, who is this? There's nobody in this church that can sing like this. Who is this? And it was one of those times when you didn't want to open your eyes to look lest you disturb something. And I said, Jesus, can I open my eyes and see who is singing? And when I opened my eyes to see who was singing, it was the little woman sitting in the chair that they had carried out with the Clorox fumes burning the tissues out of her body. Oh, oh what a manifestation of God. What a manifestation of worship. Oh, when that meeting was over, Oh, you knew that had gone right through to the throne and had satisfied his heart. There was a, a convention of composers and musicians just down the street a couple doors. And a couple of those men had walked past the church when God was giving this, this oratorio from heaven. And they heard that, those, that harmony and stepped inside the door and heard that and when the meeting was over they came up to me and they said lady you seem to be in charge here we want to know who these singers were where did you get these people from and these are the men who said we are composers we are musicians from Europe we're in a convention up here but you cannot hear in any metropolitan opera house in the world 
what we have heard in this meeting here. Who are these singers? And I said, go and talk to them. Go and talk to them. Listen to their voices. This was the dear Holy Ghost who seeks worship for Jesus. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't have to borrow anything from the world. Don't try to be like the world. Don't try to be like the nations round about us. Let other people have their any kind of singers they want to have. Let them, let them go on with that. But let us worship Jesus. Let us worship Jesus. Holy is he that is. Holy is he that was. Holy is he that evermore shall be. And this is what he wants in his spirit. He desires that we be sanctified holy. Spirit and soul and body. And if we draw back, oh, I don't like to talk like that. We don't want to draw back. But if we do, somebody else will take our place and we'll lose our place. We'll lose our place. This is what is meant in the revelation when God said they're neither hot or cold. And what he really says is they made me sick on my stomach and I had to spew them out of my mouth. That this mouth is a type of his body that he had to get rid of them and spew them out. That, that's, that's, that's awfully hard. But honey, Jesus paid a terrific price for his holy bride. And he's going to have a bride worthy of who this marvelous Redeemer is. And we want to be in that company fully redeemed, fully sanctified, fully separated, fully given to him, a company to whom Jesus is everything. And they all said, Amen. Amen.